Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Israel is, uh, guess what? Israel. Uh, many of you have heard about replacement theology. Re replacement theology has become a bit of a, sort of a reviled term, even by the people who hold to it. The notion that the church has replaced Israel. Uh, that's what I want to talk about in this video. I'll be covering uh, several topics. I hope it sort of formulates in your mind something, I hope you find it cohesive and helpful uh, during the particular time that we're going through right now as it concerns Israel, the church, uh, the book of Revelation, uh, Psalm 83, uh, our timeline, which we recently published for November, um, certain religions that uh, are kind of difficult to talk about, uh, the state of the modern day church, uh, which is basically uh, departed from the faith. Uh, for those of you who are new to this channel, uh, we hold to a pre-tribulation view. We're dispensational in our teaching. Uh, Bible scholars have scratched their heads you know, over things that seem really obvious to us now with hindsight. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of stuff and it's almost getting, you know, we've almost reached the point to where that it's, it's sort of needless to, to even do these uh, end, end days, uh, t you know, rapture sort of type, you know, you know, end, end of the, the, the age videos because everybody can see what's going on. Uh, you don't really need me or any, anybody else to, to help you figure that one out. If you've been paying attention, folks, we are living, I believe, as many millions of others do, that we are living in the uh, last of the last days. For centuries, it was extremely difficult for Christians to grasp that the word Israel in the Bible could possibly mean ethnic or national Israel since it had apparently ceased to exist as a nation. Uh, the Jewish people were scattered uh, just about everywhere across the globe uh, for two centuries, and it certainly appeared to many that God's purposes for Israel had really just come to an end. And so scholars interpreted the Bible in light of their understanding, uh, not imagining that Israel would exist again once more. Of course, we know that in 1948, Israel was reborn as a nation in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. But since the reestablishment of Israel back in the land in 1948, we can start to read the Bible now with new information that helps us to understand really understand more than we ever have just what God is talking about when He says Israel, okay? The events of 1948 have presented us the shocking uh, uh, possibility that when the Bible talks about Israel, it could now literally mean Israel. We on this channel, uh, we believe strongly in supporting Israel. Now, since the early church fathers, as far back as Justin Martyr in 160 AD, Christians have been assuming that Israel really means the church. Even by 160 AD, the people of Israel had been scattered in the land renamed Palestine for almost 100 years, so it's really easy to see how it happened. Of course, that's not the full story. Uh, Reformed theology had a heavy hand, played a heavy hand in that. Uh, so we're talking about the error of re replacement theology. I believe that's important that we understand that, uh, especially with all the, the anti-Israel protests going on. Just read Romans 9 through 11, and every time it says Israel, just replace it with the word church, and you'll quickly see that it doesn't make a lick of sense at all. Israel really means Israel in both the Old as well as the New Testaments. While the New Testament often describes Israel and the church in similar terms, both are the bride of God, the children of God, the chosen people, uh, elect of God, and so on, uh, God's children. Never does the New Testament call the church Israel. Never. The word Israel 
occurs remarkably seven t 70 times, 70 times in the New Testament, uh, 79 if you include the word Israelite. And all but two, all but two of these instances are referring to the nation of Israel and not, not to the church. Uh, the two exceptional cases being Roman, Romans 9, 6 and Galatians 6, verse 16. In the past, people have uh, really clung to Galatians 6, 16 as an example of how Israel can mean the church, but uh, let's, let's just examine that verse. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. It says, Peace and mercy be upon all who walk by this rule upon the Israel of God. That's the Revised Standard Version. Or if you prefer you know, the New International Version, uh, Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule to the Israel of God. But if we look at what the text actually says in the original text as, as well as the King James Version, uh, these translations have missed a key Greek word, a very simple word, chi in the Greek, and, the word and, okay, chi epiton, okay, it's literally translated, and as many as to the rule, this shall be peace on them and mercy, and also, also, chi can mean also and, and, or and, on the Israel of the God. In other words, even though the Greek text says that Paul was uh, pronouncing peace and mercy to the church and also to the Israel of God, those who were translating the text, well, they just basically decided that it could not possibly mean that Paul wanted to bless the house of Israel as well as the Gentile followers of Jesus. They they chose a far less common way of understanding the grammar and they, well, be honest, they just decided to lump the two together with no extinction. Now, while it is not technically incorrect translated in this manner, there, there are many, many reasons to stay with the standard meaning of the Greek word chi to mean and or also, uh, which is far more commonplace. Now, dearly beloved, God's great plan uh, as it concerns redemption is for the Jew and the Gentile alike. Looking at the context of Paul's letter to the Galatians, he's stressing that there is no need, there's no need for Gentile believers to be circumcised or to follow the law of Moses, but that redemption is through Jesus Christ Himself alone for both Jew and Gentile. However, this doesn't mean that Paul sees no distinction between Jew and Gentile because just a superficial look through the, the rest of his epistles will quickly show you uh, this uh, there, there is no male or female, he says, and by this he, he means that uh, both men and women have the same status through Christ. But of course, there remains a distinction, a very clear distinction in uh, other ways. And this, likewise, Paul talks of both the church and of Israel as separate entities many, many times. They do not blur into one. And there is zero evidence, none whatsoever, that the early church blended the two until around 160 A.D. or on 160 A.D. People who would claim that Israel means the church, they've really just got to ignore the primary meaning of, of the Greek word and, chi, which separates the two groups in the verse in order to make them both the same group. It's amazing, it's always amazed me how that the Holy Spirit chooses His words very carefully. 
Now, for centuries, it didn't dawn on Bible scholars that the term Israel could possibly really refer to the actual nation of Israel itself or, or, or at least uh, the many thousands of Israelites who were of God. And they superimposed their understanding that the church had replaced Israel. I believe it's a grave error uh, both uh, as, as far as when it, whether it comes to doctrine or whether it comes to prophecy, we kind of go off on the wrong track. Now we can see in the language of Paul throughout the epistles that he seeks to encourage Gentile believers to know that they are just as much God's people as the Israelites have always been and that they matter no less to Him. What a wonderful, wonderful God we serve. He deliberately draws parallels with Israel and the new Gentile followers of Christ showing the similarities. There are similarities, but we also know that Moses was a type of Messiah sent to uh, deliver, to save the Jewish people. And, and in no way would we say that, that, that he is, he's the same thing as Yeshua himself. In fact, we see the two standing together on the Mount of Transfiguration. No, one does not replace the other, even if one foreshadows the other uh, in a, a typological manner. Now, similarly, in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, we see the tribes of Israel together with every nation, tribe, and tongue worshiping God at the end of time. And of course, the Messiah will return to Jerusalem. Israel is Israel all the way up to the end. God has no favorites, but God does have a plan. And to, to fudge the distinction between Israel and the church means that we can miss so much when He, uh, when he said so much for us to know uh, and we can miss it when we read the Word of God. God wants us to know Him better, uh, to share His heart for Israel, and to understand His plans for Israel as it concerns uh, the whole world. In relation to the whole world, He wants us to continually grow in our understanding of His purposes, uh, redeeming all creation to Himself, seeing Israel as meaning Israel when we read the Bible it brings a a, a whole new level of revelation about just how wonderful a God it is that we serve and how that He is unfolding His perfect plan for all of us, Jew, Gentile alike. Dearly beloved, we have, as the church, the body of Christ, we have Jewish roots. The Bible is Israel-centric, not it's not replacement theology. Replacement theology was first really introduced by Augustine and, and it was also then supported by Luther and Calvin. Now these were reformers. Now reformed theology isn't bad. Uh, you're looking at, at a reformed the, theologian. I'm reformed myself. Uh, but replacement theology conflicts with dispensationalism. God has works in, in the lives of His people in different ways during different ages. The idea of re replacement theology is actually what helped lead to the Holocaust. Now, just pick up an average Bible, uh, about an 1,100-page Bible if you don't count the preface, the notes, the study notes, the commentaries, the maps, and, and et cetera, and all that. that. That translates to around 600 pages of human history, Genesis to Song of Solomon, 250 pages on the prophets, Isaiah to Malachi, 110 pages on the life of Christ, and from Matthew to John, 120, the church, Acts to Jude, and 20 pages in Revelation. So roughly 79%, if not they're pretty much accurate, 79% refers to Israel, the tribulation, and the return. Six, 66 authors that, that God used, breathed through to author it over a period of 1,500 years. 
Each day we see greater and greater the birth pains. If you've been paying attention, the birth pains have increased in visibility, frequency, intensity, and the way that they've impacted society has been something really to behold. Now this ministry began with the Revelation 12 sign in 2017. I still firmly believe that sign event, celestial event occurred, okay? Our prophetic history, we're looking at war. Conflict took place in every year of the 20th century. Every year of the 20th century, there was a war. The world was free from war for only very short periods of time. It's been estimated that roughly 187 million people died as a result of war from 1900 to the present. The actual number is likely far higher. Here we are in the year 2024 and I'm looking at nations that are at war or preparing for war and just to name a few this is not a complete list the US NATO Europe Turkey Sweden Russia Ukraine Israel Hamas now these are you know factions not nations but Hamas Hezbollah Sudan Syria Lebanon uh, North Korea South Korea, China, Taiwan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, that's, that's not a complete list, but there's a lot of wars going on. The Word says, Yea, the time cometh that, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Jesus told his disciples this in the 16th chapter of the book of John, verse 2. And for Islam, the killing of God's people is an act of worship. I have long believed and I have uh, presented on this channel enough evidence to convince folks that Islam is Christianity's counterfeit. The relationship that exists between Ishmael, the son of the bondwoman, and Islam in Bible prophecy. In fact, that's what we're looking at on Sunday in our Bible studies. It's interesting, we're looking at that while all of this is going on. And Islam and Bible prophecy, in law versus grace, in the believer's life, there's a connection there. We're looking at Sarah, Hagar, the flesh, not trusting God, Sarah thinking she can help God out, bondage, Ishmael, law, Islam, war. Okay? You can contrast that with God, Sarah, His promise, Okay, spirit, free, grace, Christianity, peace. The direct op polar opposites. That the war that we're now seeing has its roots in the son of the bondwoman. Law, synergism, works is to me more than astounding. Synergism, that is we have to cooperate with God. New birth is not just by God alone. It's associated with violence. Legalism on steroids. That's what it is. It's amazing how that end times prophecy and the existence of Islam actually confirms the monergistic God-only gospel that is being preached by the faithful in Christ today. The purpose of Daniel's 70th week. It has a purpose. It's not meant for us. Revelation makes no sense. If the church replaced Israel, none of it, especially, in my opinion, the Revelation 12 sign makes no sense because I believe that we're actually in real time looking at Revelation 12, even though the sign occurred seven years ago. Now, if you look at 2017 to the present, back in 2017, we... Trump extended a formal recognition of uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. This is when Trump came into the picture in 2019. Around March, thereabouts, the, the U.S. became the first country to recognize Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights territory, which it had held since 1967. In 2020, uh, around August, Israel and the United Arab Emirates, they signed a peace treaty. In April of 2021, uh, 45 people are killed in, uh, in the 2021 Marin Stampede during uh, Lag Biomer. 
Okay, 7 October, everyone's familiar with, 2023. It's the, the day that the, it's considered the deadliest for Jews since the Holocaust, as well as the deadliest day in Israel's history. 1,390 people are killed in the 2023 Hamas attack on Israel. That's, uh, that was a turning point in human history. So God chooses Trump. Trump becomes president. The Revelation 12 sign occurs. Are, are you listening? Trump policies sort of light the, the fuse on the keg of this dynamite that we're looking at, which is the present Middle East crisis. Now, it's all going according to God's plan. But we've got October 7, and we're now at the point, we are now at the point where Iran has said that they will attack the Saudis if they join the U.S. and Israel or assist in any way in any attack against them, Iran. This is an official statement. This is Iran's official stance right now. Many of you have heard of the two factions, the two branches of Islam, Sunni and Shia. Shia are, they're the two largest branches of Islam. The main difference between the two, uh, these two branches, is their contradicting beliefs on succession after the Prophet Muhammad died. Sunni leaders called caliphs are elected through voting, while Shiite leaders or imams are uh, supp supposedly direct descendants of Muhammad. Iran is Shia, Saudi is Sunni. Okay, let me say that again. Iran is Shia, Saudi is Sunni. The overwhelming majority of Iranians are Shia, about 90%. 90% of Iranians are, are Shia, and about, interesting enough, about 90% of Saudis are Sunni Muslims. Revelation 17.5, Mystery Babylon. I am persuaded... As, many, as are many others, that Saudi Arabia, Arabia Mecca, the, the Saudi royal family, uh, and the birthplace and the center of Islam, they match, all that matches, not most, but all, in my opinion, of the biblical requirements necessary to qualify as Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. Okay? There's many that have done good, great work on this. There, these, this Descriptions of Mr. Mystery Babylon that compare with today's Mecca, Saudi Arabia are astounding. The harlot is intimately related and connected to the last day's Islamic empire. Okay? All right. She represents the greatest and the most influential anti-Yahweh religion that has ever existed. She exists geographically in a desert region. She's likely of royal stock. She's fabulously wealthy. If you think the United States has got money, well, let me tell you, we're probably about broke. But, you know, as far as wealth is concerned, the U.S. doesn't even hold a candle to Saudi Arabia. And she persecutes and murders God's people, Christians as well as Jews. On two occasions, she's highlighted as being a persecutor of the saints in Scripture. Specifically, it is said that in her is found the blood of prophets and saints. She seductively offers mankind something that, well, appears to be very alluring and beautiful and profitable, yet in God's eyes, it's an utter abomination. She will be hated and ultimately destroyed, according to Scripture, by the same Islamic coalition of nations that she is so closely connected to. Okay? Saudi Arabia is a politically and geographically definable entity that exerts a great measure of influence over leaders, and corrupts many kings, leaders, nations, nationalities, and people groups through her religion, and through her money, and through her merchandise. The kings of the earth will share 
in her luxury. They do share in her luxury. She, she is an, both an importer as well as an exporter. The merchants of the earth have grown rich from all of the goods that she purchases. Uh, she imports vast amounts of goods. Likewise, she also provides the merchants of the world with her delicacies whereby they grow rich. They grow rich. Those who do business with the harlot are the world's great men. The world's great men. Who is in charge of running things politically in this country today? The elite. Many of the specific items that are highlighted that she imports are things that all require great wealth. We could go down a long list. Beyond this, we see that she also imports various forms of, of produce, livestock, and she even literally imports human beings. She has a large body of foreign nationals living in her midst who are warned by God to leave Babylon and return to their own respective countries. Now, I've often wondered who, who is it that really, who is Mystery Babylon? Who, who destroys Mystery Babylon? How is Mystery Babylon destroyed? When is going to Mystery Babylon going to be destroyed? These are great questions to ask. Islam, folks, is the largest anti-Christ religion that's ever existed. Saudi Arabia is the birthplace of Islam. This chaos that we're witnessing now can all be traced back to Saudi Arabian influence and support. The civil wars, the, the jihads, the conflicts, and all of these things, the blood of the slain is on the hands of the Saudi royal family. From Afghanistan to Bosnia in Sudan, Algeria, Pakistan, Israel, Kosovo, and Chechnya, uh, Saudi Arabia's fingerprints can be found everywhere if you're willing to look. Just think Al-Qaeda, think Hamas, think 9-11, which many believe, as I do, was the birthday of our Lord. When a Christian believer from Afghanistan is sentenced to death, when over 150 children are slaughtered in their elementary school in Beslan, when a suicide bomber walks into a Passover setter, and he kills over 30 Israelis and wounds hundreds more. When Christian churches are, are pillaged and destroyed in Pakistan. When the Twin Towers and thousands of lives fell. These things all fall on the heads of the Saudis. The fields where jihad and death have bloomed, where they were plowed, they were planted, they were watered, and they were cultivated by the Saudis. It is beyond doubt that the Saudis are guilty before God for the untold amounts of lives lost and the blood that has been shed through their funding, support, and efforts in the minds of the Saudis who uh, deliberately spread such evil around the globe. However, all the blood that is spilled is to them, they look at it, it is simply infidel blood. In their minds, they are spreading righteousness by purging the world of the non-Muslim unbelievers, paving the way for the eventual rule of Islam over the planet. We are focused, many of us, on Iran as being the great culprit here. I don't believe that they compare to Saudi Arabia. They believe themselves to be serving Allah, but God describes them as being drunk on the blood of the saints, and He promises to punish them completely. Completely. 
So, how will God do that? How will God do that? She'll be hated and ultimately destroyed by the same Islamic coalition of nations that is she, she is now so closely connected to. The radicals. I'm talking about when I, when I say that, I think Iran. They hate the Saudi royal family nearly as much as they hate America or the West, you, the Christians, Jews. The radicals are aware that the Saudi royal family is the greatest financial and ideological supporter of worldwide jihad. They, they, they really appreciate that fact, but they also hate them for their corruption, for their perversion, and of course their friendly relationship with the U.S. and the West. The Bible says that she'll be burned and destroyed. Her destruction will be seen from the oceans, ships offshore, opposing shores. So there's the who and there's the how. I do not believe any, anybody at this time knows the when, but I think we can all agree that we're moving in that direction and we're doing it rapidly. The coalition's motive break the Abrahamic covenant with one mind they plot together they form an alliance against you says psalm 83 5 the 10 member coalition of psalm 83 forms a covenant with each other against not only the nation of israel but the god of israel the coalition is not satisfied to only just destroy Israel as a nation. They want to wipe out the memory of the name of Israel. In effect, breaking the Abrahamic covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant, God pledges that a chosen people, children of promise, will come through Abraham. That's in Genesis chapter 22. Through Isaac, Genesis chapter 26, and through Jacob, Genesis chapter 28, and that God would give them the promised land, Genesis chapter 15 and Joshua chapter 1. The Lord appeared to Isaac, and He said, For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and will confirm the oath that I swore to your father Abraham. I will, says God, make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I'll give them all these lands, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. Genesis chapter 26. Of course, if through a human coalition the adversary could wipe out the name of Israel, that would really effectively just make the God of Israel look powerless and a liar in the face of the entire world. Don't think it's going to happen. It would also nullify other promises, including, including the following. The Davidic covenant, the eternal throne, 2 Samuel chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 9 and Luke 1. For a child will be born to us, a son. Think Revelation 12. A son will be given to us and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of His government or of, of peace on the throne of David, the resurrected King David, and over His kingdom, Isaiah chapter 9. 
This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jeremiah chapter 31. The Word of God is accurate and reliable and no adversary can thwart God's plans. His covenant with Abraham is unconditional. His covenant with Abraham is everlasting. Even after Israel's disobedience, which, which he foresaw, he would bring his people home to their own land after a period of exile. It is not for your sake people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Ezekiel chapter 36. And God has been fulfilling this prophecy and others like it, much to the dismay of those seeking to wipe out the very memory, the very memory of Israel. I hope in some slight way that you've found this video helpful. We're looking up with you as the day draws near. We pray for you all constantly. I love you all, I truly do. Rest in Him, for He loves you with an everlasting love. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.